So welcome back. In our last video, we talked about how if we have oscillators that are coupled together, like these masses connected together by springs, then we can have disturbances in one mass. If I displace, say, this leftmost mass downward, well, that will experience restoring forces and it will start oscillating, but it will also exert forces on the next mass in the chain. And then that one will exert forces on the next mass. And so what you have end up getting is this chain reaction where the original disturbance ends up propagating down the chain and you get what we would call a traveling pulse or a traveling wave pulse that moves from left to right. The energy that you originally supplied is transferred to the other masses in the chain. And so eventually that first mass will just go back to its equilibrium position. And then we understood that this was a very good model of something like a stretched string, like a guitar string where you're pulling on both sides and so that you have this tension force that is acting not only on the left and the right, but also at every point along the string. If I sp imagined dividing the, sp the string at some arbitrary point in the middle, then the right side would be pulling on the left and the left would be pulling on the right with that same tension force. So the way to understand how a part, each part of the string is like an oscillator, is just to imagine displacing this one part upward a little bit. And so then what you see is that, so that part that I've circled or, or put inside the square, squared, I don't know, um, that has a certain mass. And when I displace it, it, there's a certain restoring force acting on it. So that's coming from the tension forces acting on the left and on the right. And because the string is bent, those are no longer canceling each other. So there's a down and left force and there's a down and right force. And so the horizontal force ends up canceling, but the vertical force adds up and you get a net downward force. Similarly, if I moved it down, you'd get a net upward force. And so we expect that the physics of this stretch string is pretty much going to be the same as the physics of this chain of oscillators. So we expect that disturbances on the left will lead to traveling waves that go to the right. And we're going to see that now in a simulation. So what we have here is a simulation of a stretched string. And it looks like the string is made up of little beads. And I think that's just to emphasize that the string has a lot of different parts to it, and these parts are coupled together. So what I can do here is control the left side of the string with this wrench. And so let's see what happens when I move the wrench up and down. Okay, so this is kind of in slow motion here, but what you see is that I end up getting this wave pulse. Like in our chain of oscillators, we get a disturbance that moves to the right along the string. And in this case, the right end of the string must be very far away. But the wave pulse is just traveling and it doesn't come back. So we can make various different shapes of wave pulse. If I say go up and then down and then up again, there's a different shape than it was before. And so one thing I want to emphasize when you have a wave on a string, if we wanted to describe that wave, then one piece of information is what does the wave look like at some specific time. So I've paused the video here at one time, and then we have a shape of the wave. So basically what that is, it's like a graph of the displacement versus the position along the wave. And so sometimes we call that a snapshot graph. And so this is the snapshot graph. This is like the snapshot graph for the wave at a particular time. It's really just a picture of the wave. If I let the time go a little bit more, then we see this, now we pause it again, and now we see that the wave looks a little bit different. It's actually the same shape of pulse, but it's moved over to the right. And so the information about what a wave is doing in time, you can think of that as a combination of these snapshots 
one for each possible time. Now, okay. So, what we just talked about, I've indicated that here in this series of pictures that when you have a wave of any type, whether it's this pulse moving to the right or any other sort of wave that we'll be talking about in the future, then one of the basic things you can ask is what does the wave look like at some time? And this is the idea of the snapshot graph as I explained. And I've indicated here four different snapshot graphs for four different times. And this is for a wave pulse which is traveling to the right. So it's basically on the x-axis we have position, the position along, in this case, the string for our simulation, and the y-axis is displacement. And so it really is just what the wave looks like. But there's one other kind of graph we could make to describe the wave. So maybe instead of trying to represent what the whole wave looks like at one particular time, maybe instead of that we would be interested in knowing what does just one part of the string, one specific place on the string, what is that doing as a function of time? So here's an example where I have that same wave as before. But now imagine there's a little red bead on one part of the string. And suppose that we want to keep track of not the entire wave, but just what that little red bead is doing. How is it moving up and down as the wave pulse passes by? So for that, what we want to do is make a time graph, the same sort of thing that we've been doing all along for our oscillators and other systems. We just want to imagine making a time graph for the height of that bead as this wave pulse travels by. And so in this case, the time graph might look something like the one that I've drawn above. So the reason is that we imagine at first the bead is just sitting there at the equilibrium position. And then when this first peak hits it, well, the bead moves upward. And so then the on the time graph, the displacement is positive for a while. And then a little bit later, the bead is actually below its equilibrium position as this downward part of the pulse passes by. And then finally it goes upward again, and then it goes flat. So from this series of history graphs, or sorry, of snapshot graphs, we can make this history graph. And that basically just keeps track of what one point on the wave is doing. So this is going to be very important to us when we're thinking about hearing and sound because as we'll talk about next week, sound waves, while they're spread out in space, they're traveling from some, maybe a musical instrument outwards, and you are just at some place uh, perceiving the sound wave. So you're basically at some fixed location. And so what we want to understand in terms of what do we hear, we want to understand what this whole wave is doing just at one location as a function of time. And that's what determines what we'll hear. So I want to give you an example for you to think through. And so in this example, what I've done is shown only one picture at one specific time. And I'm telling you that this wave is a combination of pulses, which are all traveling to the right at some velocity, whatever the velocity of this wave is. And so what I want you to do is try to make a time graph of what will this red bead do as a function of time. And then once you've done that, I want you to think about how would your graph change if these pulses were to travel faster. So pause the video and maybe write, do that on a piece of paper and then come back. Okay, so now we'll talk about that. So let's just imagine that we are standing there watching this red bead and we have our notebook handy and we're just recording what's happening to the vertical position of this bead as all these pulses travel by. Okay. And so what I can do, oops, jumped ahead there. Uh, what I can do here is think about making a graph 
And so see at first the bead is going to be stationary until this first peak reaches it. Okay, and then at that point, what will happen is that the bead will go upward. Okay, and then it will come back down as this passes by. And then when that second pulse comes to it, it will go downward and then it'll go back up. And then eventually that third pulse will reach it and it'll go up and then it'll go down. Okay. So what we see is that it's kind of a similar shape to this picture, except it's reversed in terms of the order of these peaks in the picture, because it's traveling right from left to right, this peak on the right is the one that actually encounters our bead first in time. So that's showing up first in our time graph. So now let's think about what would happen if the pulses traveled faster. So if you want, we could just imagine now, let me, let me um, draw it down a little bit lower, so not try to draw right on top again. I'll try to draw the time graph. I'm gonna imagine I'm again standing there. The same shape of wave is again traveling by, but now it's traveling at a faster velocity. And so what that means is the same things will happen, but everything is going to happen faster. Okay, so it's gonna go up much sooner, and then it'll go down by the same amount as before, and then it'll go up again, and then down, and then it'll be flat, okay? So if the velocity increased, then everything kind of gets squished in time. Okay. And so that's gonna be important uh, moving forward in the next lecture when we talk about waves that have a sinusoidal shape, that have a repeating shape in space, this idea that the time graph gets squished when the velocity increases, that is related to a general relation between uh, the wave velocity and the frequency of waves. If you have this, if you keep the same shape, like the same, in that case, um, distance between various peaks, and you make the wave travel faster, then the frequency of the bead going up and down is going to be higher. Okay, so that'll be very important and we're going to talk about that in great detail during the next lecture.